from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello, welcome to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have with me Kavita. She's joining me live from the U.S., Kavita, thank you very much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your is area of expertise? Sure. Thank you for having me. And um, so I'm basically an AI practitioner of over 15 years. I started doing AI when it was just a very research-oriented topic. Mm -hmm. um, so back then, we didn't even have the tools that we have today. So even for tools like SVMs, you have to write all the code for data preparation. Um, so that's where I got my start. So I went from research um, to doing more research in my PhD program. And then when I graduated, I was doing solving a lot of industry problems, um, solving AI for business type of problems like recommendation systems, uh, classification models. And this was across different industries like working on code, working on healthcare data, so a variety of uh, domains. Mm -hmm. And today I'm a consultant. Um, and I've been doing this for the past five years. And I've also authored the book, The Business Case for AI. And my focus is very much uh, applications of AI from a very practical perspective. So not so much research oriented, but more practical perspective. That, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And again, thank you very much for being here today. So. Just to get started, you know, um, companies that, you know, they are starting to think to explore the possibilities of AI, what should you say are the first step they should take to successfully implement AI in their organization? Yeah, so the first step, especially for medium to enterprise, large businesses, is trying to understand where the actual AI opportunities are. Because often what I see in practice is that uh, people just come up with cool ideas and then mm -hmm. they go after those ideas and then it becomes a prototype, a tool, but then they don't have consumers uh, because nobody really needs it. It doesn't really solve a real business problem. So I would say look for the really high impact AI opportunities and that's what you should go after. So one of one or two of them will be pretty easy to implement. Well, maybe mm -hmm. things where the tasks have been done manually and maybe with the use of AI, you can now improve that whole workflow. So look for those, classify those as into buckets, like this is all the problems in customer service. This is all the problems in HR. So you will know where your competitive advantage really is going to be by just looking at those problems. Okay, so first they need, of course, to do kind of an assessment of what are the areas that needs improvement and then try to, to apply uh, AI to it, right? Yeah, and once they've identified the problems, next step is to like frame it. So actually go through each one mm -hmm. and figure out what pain point it solves. Um, is it really worth using AI or can you do it manually? Or is it cheaper to just do it manually? Because sometimes okay. having one person to solve the problem versus implementing a whole AI system can be much cheaper. So yeah. framing the problem is a very critical step. And I talk a lot about this in my book uh, because I think this is the key in either pursuing or eliminating an initiative. Yeah, that's that's great. And you know, I, I like this, like if you really don't overcomplicate things, if you can do it with, you know, still manually cheaper, that's fine. Now, yeah. Then let's take the next step. So if I'm today a business and I figured out, as you said, like I frame it, I know that I need to apply AI here, but how do, how can I know as a company or an, as an organization 
that I am ready actually to adopt AI? Like, what are the common challenges that I might face in the initial stages? Um, so I would say a few things. To know whether you're ready to apply AI, you need to look at a few things. One is if you have a manual process that where you are doing a lot of repetitive work and the data from that repetitive work is available in some form, and this process is painful by maybe introducing some level of software automation, it can significantly improve maybe the number of tasks you complete. So that's a good indicator that this might be a good AI problem because data seems to be there. Um, we could use some software automation, maybe or maybe not it's AI. Um, and it has been solved before. So you understand the problem and you'll know how to measure success because you have this baseline which is the manual approach of doing things. So when you put AI in the loop, then you can say, hey, we are getting 60% accuracy doing this manually, but with an AI system, it's 90%. So there is a comparison mechanism right there. So that's mm -hmm. one way to look at it. The other mm -hmm. approach is more high level, enterprise level approach where you're creating a strategy to prepare the organization to become AI ready, which means once you put AI into production, you should be able to repeat the process over and over again. So you, you have AI in different parts of your company. So that is more strategic and um, that requires looking at your data infrastructure. So are you collecting data? Are you collecting the right type of data, the format? So all of that data related pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you might, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, in my, in my book, I, I discuss um, five elements of AI preparation. I call it B-Kids. So budget, culture, infrastructure, data, and skills. So these five elements you, is something you have to look at for enterprise level AI strategy. Yeah, great. Actually, I was about to ask you about the book because you mentioned the book a couple of times, the business case yeah. for AI. Like only very high level, what are some of the key takeaways that can guide businesses in, in building a strong foundation for AI integration? Yeah, so common takeaway is data has to be in place. You need to look into your infrastructure. So your IT infrastructure may not be ready to support AI systems. So you'll, look at, you'll have to look into how to expand that. How do you conduct a pilot to see which platforms you want to start using? And... Um, yeah, so to evaluate different platform options mm -hmm. and also your cultural readiness, because some companies, as you know, they are very afraid of automation because of True. losing jobs and a lot of risk factors like biases. So they are very weary of implementing AI. So cultural elements is also critical and that comes with education and yeah. skills. The yeah. last one is skills. You need the data scientists, you need your... AI experts. So are you willing to hire these people or do you want to outsource? So you'll have to think about how you're going to implement those solutions. Yeah, I think it's common because I remember back in the days when, you know, we started to talk about digital transformation and digitization, you know, the same, I would say, frictions uh, business start to see because of the culture, which is, I think it's very important. And the skills, as you mentioned, is something really important. Now, like from your experience, like, have you seen, you know, examples of companies that really successfully started with AI and, you know, they benefit from it? Like, if I want to reframe this another way, what would be the biggest benefits that, you know, organization would see when they adopt AI in their initiatives? Um, the biggest near-term benefits would be, for some cases, increase in revenues. So mm -hmm. if you're an e-commerce company, the use of AI has a huge potential for boosting revenues because of the discovery and recommendation capabilities that it can offer. So it depends on the industry. And then like for manufacturing, the use of AI also limits revenue loss because you're doing things um, more in real time versus stopping the production line for humans to do the work, like um, quality control pieces. So even if uh, you're trying to detect like cracks and dents and problems in like bottle caps that you're manufacturing, an AI system can take an image of that and determine um, if indeed there's an abnormality in the cap. 
So you don't need a human in the loop to do that. So that immediately uh, makes the production line more efficient. So you get a lot more throughput. So it does affect revenues, but at the same time, it also affects efficiency. It affects employee burnout. So it, it affects multiple things. So I would yeah. say it's very problem dependent. That's great. Now, one thing, you know, that caught my, my attention when, when you were introducing yourself and you said, like, you know, you covered from business perspective, like, how is AI in the business world different from, from the academy or academic yeah. world, I would say? That's a very good question. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised that it rarely comes up. Um, so the research world is more uh, predictable. So sometimes you know what data you're testing on. Sometimes you know what problem exactly you're solving. So it's very, very narrow. And those data sets that you evaluate on um, over and over again come from standardized uh, benchmarks, benchmark data sets that researchers have published. So every time a new model comes up, like from chat GPT to something more recent, uh, GPT-4, they're using the same they may be using the same benchmark data sets to test how well each task performs. But in reality, our problems are not so well defined. We have company specific data. So maybe you're working in an agriculture domain. So your data may look very, very different from what's being benchmarked. So if you're going to trust that benchmark uh, uh, evaluation numbers, then you might be surprised to see that, hey, it works so poorly on my data. Why is that? And also industry problems are more messy. So there is not one model that can solve the problem beautifully. You'll have to have like um, one model to solve majority of the problems and then a rules base to solve the edge cases and then humans for fallback. So it's often messier and it's more hybrid rather than a single model for one problem. Yeah, that's great. So if I want to make an analogy, you know, like when, when we used to be in school and college, we used to like study math and everything you know it's like neat and you know the, yeah. the graphs look but in real life we know that you know when we do the experiments like things get a little bit messy yeah. and i think because we re we deal with real data it's as you said like the real data it would be like not as the one we use in in research which is just great now you mentioned a little bit about you know chat gpt and generative ai like of course, I would discuss from two perspectives. Like, first of all, from you with your all your experience and you work with a lot of businesses, like where are you seeing it like mostly used from industry perspective? And you know, what do you expect from you know tools like Chat GPT? Because we know like generative AI is not only Chat GPT, but what where do you see like you know the, the, the future is 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 you know bringing us to from business perspective? Yeah, the future is moving pretty fast. So as of now, I would say um, idea generation is a good use of tools like ChatGPT because of its underlying problems like hallucination. But there's also another problem, cost. So a lot of the text classification tasks or uh, things that you would train a model to do, which now you can easily do with ChatGPT, costs a lot of money. So each call to the API costs mm -hmm. The money and this is not just um, after deployment it's also through experimentation that you're paying then through testing and then deployment and then after that for years to come you are tied into this solution versus you training a simple machine learning model which solves the task maybe equally well but you have control over the data what goes in and what comes out and you can change it over time so it's a one-time costs which you have to maintain but there's a lot mm -hmm. more control so it depends on which way you want to go are you okay with getting tied into this api which could change over time the performance can change under the hood over time so your company's performance also will become unpredictable so you'll have to think through those risks and the costs so as you know risks of tools like chat gpt because it tries to generate it's sometimes making up non-factual answers and it happens all the time. And yeah. also the answers are less predictable. So one time it may say A, B, and C, next time it may say something completely different. So it's less predictable than uh, training your own models for a specific mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think ChatGPT will shine in um, helping you generate data to train those specific models. 
so you can create a lot of synthetic data using ChatGPT. Uh, you can use it for things like paraphrasing. So if you need sentences that are paraphrased in different words or headline creation. So those things, it's safe to use a tool like ChatGPT because it's always a human who's verifying, is this uh, something I should be using or not? Mm -hmm. So I would say it has its users, but I wouldn't say that that's the only option right now. Like you should use generative AI. Um, so that's not the case. Okay, so so I can understand from what you are saying, like yeah. it's not as some people mention, you know, a a silver bullet for every, you know, use case, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it has its use cases. And also it depends on the company's policies. They may not want to upload uh, proprietary data to a third party API. So then what are you left with? Maybe problems where it's public data that you're using and you are allowed to send that to a third party API. So for mm -hmm. those for those other problems, you'll have to find different ways of solving it. Maybe use ChatGPT to create that uh, synthetic data for you and then train your own model or uh, just train your own model using the data that you have. Yeah, uh, unless I'm not sure if, if they would be able to come with something to run the model. <laughs> of course, like I'm doing something very theoretical in a cheaper way locally where the data would be processed locally. I know like it's, you know, like you, you need, too much compute power to do this. Um, but this is something I raised also previously with someone, you know, what she mentioned to me that it, it's sometimes hard to do, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so you mentioned about the risks, but you know, when people, you know, when they discuss about the risks, there's some ethical aspect. So what are the eth ethical considerations that businesses need to be mindful when, when they decide to utilize tools like ChatGPT? Yeah, so one of the most common risks, like I said earlier, was the hallucination aspect. So if you're asking it to come up with answers to specific questions, the answers may look very accurate just by looking at it. But when a subject matter ex expert checks it, they may find faults in it. So factual accuracy is at stake with any generative AI type tools. So that's the first risk. So maybe you don't want to use it to generate text, or even if you use it to generate text, there should be a way to validate that what is generated is factual. So having that check, final check in place is critical for generative AI type tools. The second is it may have underlying biases. So let's say, you're using ChatGPT to make predictions on who should get a loan. You'll mm -hmm. say, okay, this person has this, this, this background. Should they get a, a loan or not? Like an education loan or not? So it can have its underlying biases. Maybe it thinks that specific groups should not get loans or younger students should not get loans. So whatever the bias is, is. and that can perpetuate to the model. And you will not know of these biases because you have no control over the data that it's trained on, so you, you are less aware. And another thing that with uh, tools like generative AI that people miss is the evaluation component. So when, in, when we do traditional ML, we are forced to evaluate the model in different ways. But with generative AI, people are not just building applications over the model without evaluating how well it's doing on the task. So I don't see much of like accuracy numbers being uh, generated on a specific task, for example, like question answering. So you need to have that evaluation piece, regardless of whether using Gen AI or just pure machine learning. Yeah, like this is, you know, just brought to my mind, like how companies that own these large language models, they have a huge responsibility, I think, with, with the data that they own, actually. Um, and, you know, like, if, if as you said, like they have, a biased data that might give a really bad decisions and you know even like sometimes it, it would give even wrong uh, uh, assumptions i don't know like really it's, it's something that you know business should be aware of when deciding yep. to adopt now like of course now everyone talks about generative ais but is there anything like because you you are also close to to, to a lot of businesses and also like you you have your experience and you did the research part as well 
everyone is talking about generative AI, but is there anything, you know, like you, you predict that also to come to the surface anytime yeah. soon that also would be, you know, interesting for, for us to, to adopt? Yeah, I think there is a lot of research going on in common sense reasoning where we actually want to reason. So right now with um, chat GPT and generative AI, it's not really reasoning, it's generating based on what it understands, based on historical data. So it's not reasoning like us humans. But what would be nice is if you can apply some common sense knowledge to answering questions. So that will give um, more factual accuracy to responses. So that is currently in the works. Um, so you may see more and more common sense reasoning in the next three to five years. And also I think generative AI itself, they're going to have some way to maybe check factual accuracies. There's research going on, on fact checking these types of tools. So that will add a layer of, I think, um, safety for us to use these tools more reliably. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you see any intersection between AI and other emerging technologies that businesses will benefit from? Um, that could be, um, uh, I mean, I think there already is like AI and blockchain, but I, I, I think AI and cybersecurity has the biggest impact mm -hmm. uh, today because we have a lot of problems with cybersecurity, high volume problems, very hard to detect. But with AI, we can solve a lot of those uh, detection issues. So I think that's where there's a lot of potential. And I think a lot of governments are focusing and investing in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you know, the cybersecurity part and actually multiple guests, they mentioned that a lot of people who are in cybersecurity now, they want to quit within the next six to 12 months. And now the oh. hope is, yeah, so the hope is that AI can take a little bit of their, I would say, stress and, you know, all the things that they have to deal with. But again, the challenge is bad actors might be using also AI yeah. on the other side. So now it's like we have AI fighting another AI, which is an interesting thing that we need to see how it will, will, will end in the future. Yeah. Now, um, now I talk sometimes with, with different businesses from different sides, and they tell me, you know, like we don't think biz, uh, AI is for us. Like we, AI is only for enterprise. Is that true? Um, for small businesses, AI is for them, but maybe not building something from scratch. Mm -hmm. It can be tools that are already published. Like um, we have a lot of um, text to speech. So to read articles, I use a lot of text to speech because sometimes I don't want to, I want to just rest my eyes and I want something to read to me. So, which is pretty good, which if you use, um, Microsoft Edge or any, there, there are lots of tools, apps, they'll do text to speech. Um, and maybe speech to text, like audio from meetings to text, transcribe, mm -hmm. so that you can then analyze what you discussed and pick out specific information to put in your proposal. So there's a lot of use cases for us, um, small businesses to use AI also. And chat GPT to generate ideas, um, just content ideas. You don't have to use it as the final thing, but even if you ask a few questions, it can spark ideas in your brain that you can then uh, explore further. Um, and also storytelling. So some of us are not good in storytelling. So let's say you want to write a bio of yourself. So you have a rough bio and you want it to rewrite your bio. So mm -hmm. using the rewritten bio, you can then just add it and make it look uh, more accurate. So lots yeah. of ways to use AI. Yeah. Great. Uh, just I want to give a hint for people who would be listening to us. Um, try to, to, you know, instead of giving orders to chat GPT, try to ask questions because just a, a personal experience, I'm, I get always better results. And as you said, try to ask it to make it in a storytelling way or try to put some, um, you know, like uh, put some how they sell sentiment, you know, like tell it, okay, tell it in a funny way or tell it in a professional way. So uh, when you give this uh, command, I would say in the prompt, I, I get better uh, uh, results usually. Now we talked to Kavita a lot about uh, chat GPT, but what are some of the other tools that you use yourself and you find them useful? 
Yeah, I use a lot of the text to speech, speech to text for my own work. Um, uh, Microsoft has a PowerPoint designer feature within. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's AI generated, but it's it's really good. Like I use a lot of visuals in my slides, and now instead of hiring somebody to go make those slides look better, I used Microsoft's visual designer, and it does a really good job. Um, and also um, for blogging, I use like title suggestions from tools like ChatGPT. Um, it, it gives me decent results, which I tweak and then make it my own. So nice. yeah, so this is, these are some of the ways that I do use AI in my personal work. Okay, nice. Yeah. Just to, to, to add to what you said, I use the designer as well, but if you are uh, into using some tools like Canva, for example, so Canva and if you need to be on the paid version and I'm not um, affiliated with Canva in any way, I pay them actually. So they had now a, they call it AI assistant kind of. Mm -hmm. So if you want to design a slide, you put what you are trying to do and then it generates like five to six slides for you and then you can complete from there, which is excellent. I use, um, and again, I'm not affiliated with any of these tools guys. So I use Jasper AI, Jasper AI also same as Kavita mentioned, it can give, you know, some blog posts and, you know, titles and these kinds yeah. of things. So. Uh, I use it as a tool. Now, one of the things, and I'm asking a professional because people, and maybe we repeated multiple times on the show, but really do you think that AI would replace and eliminate a lot of jobs? And, you know, what should we do in, in, in order to, to save the, our jobs? Like, well, what's, what's your thought about this topic? Yeah, I think... If your job is so specific that you're doing one specific task, like maybe you're just inspecting bottle cap uh, cracks and dents, then it's highly likely those jobs are going to be reduced. So if the maybe you have 500 jobs, now you may have just 10 of those jobs. But your role then becomes something different. So instead of being that QA engineer who sits and does that work, you're going to become maybe the data generator for those systems because AI systems, they can't learn on their own. They need good quality data to make uh, high quality predictions. So you can become the data uh, generators for the systems. You can become the quality assurance managers for AI systems. So let's say it makes a lot of mistakes. So you have to go in and debug. Why is it making those mistakes? Then feed right. it back into the model and then the model gets retrained. So mm -hmm. you're going to be working closely with this AI systems rather than doing the work yourselves, which is probably a good thing because humans tend to get very distracted um, and bored on repetitive tasks. So if you have a software mechanism helping you, that's already a good thing. So even when I do my research, I always wish there is a tool that can do some of the groundwork for me. And I just go through that results because that saves me a lot of time. So I think our workflows will be more AI augmented and we will become uh, more the people who were working in those roles will become the quality assurance managers and, and they'll have roles around these AI systems. Mm -hmm. Do you think we will see AI in, in a, let's call it like decision-making role or managerial role? Can, can we rely on AI to, to have, um, you know, decision-making roles? Decision making on specific tasks, like does this um, item have a defect or not? So like specific tasks, uh, but I don't think it's going to do the work that a manager does because manager is not just doing specific decisions. They are uh, solving problems between team members. They are corresponding with their upper level management. So there's a lot that humans bring into the picture that AI systems cannot just replace. So all that mm -hmm. collaboration, the emotional aspect, uh, conflict resolution. So all of that, I don't think an AI system can handle well. And even if it does try to handle, uh, it's going to take you down some rabbit hole. It's going to use some therapy tools and say you need therapy or something <laughs> that it's learned from data. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is what I always tell, you know, um, anyone who asks me, 
um, like don't be scared because AI needs always actually someone to give the prompt, right? So now, mm -hmm. because people are now familiar with this term prompt, uh, chat GPT. Yeah. So, but it applies to, to AI in general and you know better than me, of course, like AI is like, think about as a black box and you have an input and you have an output. So mm -hmm. always the input needs to come from a human um right like and and we need to give the orders to get the results and you know this completely even the autonomous systems and correct me if i'm wrong kavita even an autonomous ai system actually needs also you know the spark or the ignite of of it it comes from a human right yeah the initial data generation has to come from some human process so which has already been done the data is still very essential to this ai systems and we generate that data yeah, are we living a hype or is it a moment, you know, the, the AI moment? Like, well, what do you think? I think it's both. So we have a lot of hype, but that hype is a good thing because it has caused a lot of companies and leaders wanting awareness. So what I've seen is that um, a lot of people who read my book, they started off with generative AI, chat GPT, and then they wanted to learn more about this whole space of AI. And then they read my book, then they learn, oh, it's not just that simple. We need to think about all this risk. We need to think about data preparation. So it got them into AI and thinking about AI and now thinking through strategies, uh, whether it's enterprise or small businesses, they are thinking through strategies. So I oh. think um, it's a mix of good and a little bit of bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's good that's good uh, per personally I'm, I'm i'm with you like it's it's both because ai is not something new it's something that has mm -hmm. been you know in the from last century actually the research is started but yeah i think what chat gpt mainly did it brought it to to the you know to the to the scene the more. forefront yeah yeah exactly and and this is where everyone now start to talk about ai but yeah i i, I agree 100 percent with you now kavita i have a very you know famous last question is there anything that you wished i asked you um yes actually i was thinking about that last question um so i was talking about the hype right so mm -hmm. with the hype call comes a lot of dangers with AI. And the danger is not that AI systems are going to become super smart and take over all humans, mm -hmm. but it's in the misuse of this technology. So people who don't quite understand how it works, they start building applications on it without understanding the risks. And that has a lot of downstream problems. It is going to have a lot of downstream problems. And we have already seen this in a case where uh, a, a tool like ChatGPT took somebody on a rabbit, like I said, in a on a rabbit hole through therapy-based uh, talk, and that mm. person ended up taking their lives. Um, so that kind of danger um, will become more uh, prominent. So I what I what I suggest is that people think through the risks and think through the um, evaluation aspects of AI. Okay, that's really informative. Yeah. Uh, well, Kavita, thank you very much for your time today uh, on this episode. I really appreciate the time and you know the, um, the information that you provided. Where they can find more about you and the book? Yeah, so my website, so www.kavita-ganesan.com. And uh, I, I guess you'll add that to the show notes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also my company website is um, opinosis-analytics.com. Okay, that's yeah. great. So I will make sure that this will be in the episode uh, description, as you mentioned. Thank you very much for the time today. And as usual, this is how I uh, end my episodes. To the audience, if you have any questions, any feedback, you know, as Kavita mentioned, you can reach out to her, like you can learn about the book and, you know, uh, more about her work. If you have questions about, you know, this topic or the show in general, you can reach out to me by email, LinkedIn, or Twitter, where I'm most active. If you are interested to be a guest, like Kavita was today, you can also reach out to me and we can arrange for that. And um, as usual, I hope you enjoyed the episode today and until we meet in another episode. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.